Welcome everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about strategies for showing individual level data on line graphs. So after people watch the session on why you shouldn't use a bar graph to present continuous data and what to use instead, many people have questions about alternatives for line graphs and line graphs are a little bit more challenging. There are very good alternatives for um, bar graphs of continuous data, such as dot plots, box plots, violin plots, that allow you to see individual level like data points. But the situation is much more complicated for line graphs, and the alternatives aren't nearly as strong or as clear. However, we'll talk about a few options and how to know which situation or which type of graph might work best for your data. So the first option that you have is something called small multiples. And small multiples are where you make one small graph for each individual in your data set. So it could be an animal, a participant, a sample, um, so on and so forth. And you are going to apply the same scales for all graphs. And it's really important that every single graph in your small multiple does have the same scale because where that line is positioned relative to that standard scale is giving you information about how that individual differs from other in the, others in the data set. So every graph in your small multiples needs to have exactly the same scale. You can arrange your small multiples horizontally or vertically, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes. Um, and you want to, one strategy that can you, you can use is emphasize individual responses using darker colors, and then de-emphasize the axes or the frame for your data by using lighter colors. And this just helps the lines for individual responses to jump out a little bit more compared to the data frame or the axes in which the data are shown. I mentioned that you can align your small multiples horizontally or vertically. So let's take a look at some examples. Here's an example where you might choose to align small multiples vertically in order to show differences in the time course. So here you can see I have a red group and a blue group. And if I examine the changes in time course between the two groups, you can see that in the red group, the response appears to start and peak earlier, whereas in the blue group, the response appears to be a bit delayed and there's a flatter peak. And organizing my small multiples vertically allows my eye to quickly scan down the line of the graphs and pick up these differences. An alternative approach is to align your small multiples horizontally, and this can be useful for showing differences in the magnitude and direction of responses. And so here you can see I've aligned the small multiples horizontally, so the individual with the largest increases first, and then I get towards individuals with smaller de increases and then actually decreases um, over time as I get further along in the horizontal set of small multiple graphs for each individual participant in my data set. So if you want to compare differences on the y-axis as opposed to the x-axis, you might choose to align your small multiples horizontally. There are a few things to remember about small multiples in terms of advantages and disadvantages. One of the advantages is that small multiples quickly convey information about individual responses, and they work best when each line represents an observation of interest. So, for example, if you have changes in mortality rate over time for five different countries, small multiples are particularly useful. Um, it can be a little bit more challenging when you're working with continuous data and you might have average values across different participants. Some disadvantages are that it can be difficult to compare groups or see summary statistics. The small multiples do have one graph for every individual in your data set. And so the larger your data set is, the more, fig the more small graphs you will have and the larger your figures will be. You can have also issues with axis compression. Um, and so if your axes, because your, your graphs are quite small, you can end up compressing your lines down into that very small space, which can make it hard to assess small differences between individuals. And then finally, if you have outliers, again, the axis has to be the same for all individuals in your data set. So any outliers that you have are going to adjust the scale so that they can be shown, which may make it very hard to see observations that aren't outliers and to detect differences between them. There are some strategies that you can use if you want to use small multiples to show group data. 
Um, the first option is to show summary statistics on each graph. So in the example here, the shaded region for both the green and the blue group represents one standard deviation above and one standard deviation below the mean for each group. And you can then see that there is a line on each of these small multiple graphs that shows the data for one participant within that group. So the advantages is that we're able to see the summary statistics on each graph. However, the disadvantage is that these summary statistics that we're showing complicates what's intended to be a very simple graph. Another option for showing individual level data on a line graph is what's called the spaghetti plot. And in the spaghetti spot plot, you simply make one line for each individual in the data set. And if you have multiple groups, you might use a different color for each group. And so you can see some examples. Um, the first in all black, all participants are in the same group across three conditions. And then in the second example, we have three different groups, one in red, one in green, and one in blue. Spaghetti plots work well for small, simple data sets. So for example, if you have paired data with one to two groups and a small sample size, then simply showing the how each pair is connected um, and the two data points that, that match together can be very valuable. And you can also combine these with a separate graph that shows the change scores for each group. And this will quickly give you a sense of the distribution of the data points, um, whether all individuals are increasing or decreasing or staying the same, or whether you have a combination of different responses. So the spaghetti plot, as you probably already determined, has advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage of a spaghetti plot is that it's useful for small samples with few crossing lines and simple experimental designs. So for example, one or two groups and two conditions or time points. However, spaghetti plots don't particularly work well with larger data sets when you have many crossing lines. This can lead to a very complicated graphic um, that essentially just looks like a mess, hence the name spaghetti plot, and these graphs can be very hard to interpret. The other issue is that the spaghetti plot alone doesn't show the change scores across your different time points or conditions, and so a separate graph is needed to illustrate that information. With large data sets, one technique that you can use is to show semi-transparent lines um, for each individual. And this means that your regions where many participants are clustered will have darker lines um, because the semi-transparent lines will be overlapping and you'll have more crossing lines in that area. The disadvantage of this approach is you can't see individual level data. So you can use it to get a sense of which regions have more data points in them but you won't be able to see responses for one person versus another. Another option that you can use to modify the spaghetti plot is doing something called untangling the spaghetti plot. And here's an example of this. So here we have small multiples for each individual in the data set. And each small multiple shows all individuals in the data set, but only emphasizes the response of one individual. And each of the graphs represents a different or emphasizes the response of a different individual in the data set. So here we have the axes and the lines for individuals who are not emphasized shown in gray, light gray. And then the individual that is emphasized is a slightly thicker line and is shown in black in the foreground. And so this allows us to quickly see how that one individual compares to all of the others in the graph um, and to assess the variability in responses across individuals. Again, this is using a small multiples, so the same advantages and disadvantages that apply to small multiples also apply here. Um, the larger your data set, the larger your graph will end up being, and you need to use the same axis for every one of your small multiples so that readers can visually compare the locations of the lines across graphs. Another option is to show responses for selected individuals in your data set. And so here we have a data set with many data points taken from different women at different stages of pregnancy. And the authors or creators of this graph have simply selected a few individuals to show. And often these selections might be made based on a mathematical characteristic. So for example, one participant in each quartile. <clears throat> 
This technique is useful when the number or timing of measurements varies between participants. So in this graph, I have some individuals who have three measurements, whereas others might have two or four. And each of these measurements are taken at different time points in pregnancy. There were no standard time points where everyone had measurements made. The showing observations for particular individuals can be a particularly useful strategy if you're working with data like this. The advantages of this approach is that it provides some information about individual responses and you still only have one graph, so unlike small multiples, it doesn't take up extra space. The disadvantages is that there's always a possibility that the individuals that you select to show may not be representative and could give a misleading impression of the data. A final strategy for showing longitudinal data um, at an individual level is the lasagna plot. And so here we have one row per subject and responses are color coded. And rows are then reordered to show subgroups with particular patterns of responses or similar colors. This strategy works best for large data sets and categorical outcomes. If you're working with a continuous outcome, then you have to make it categorical and assign a color code to each of your categories. It's also easy to handle missing data because you can simply leave that space blank. One other option we have for those of you who are working with small data sets is a tool that we created. And the objective of this tool was to create tools that are needed to transform scientific publications from static reports into interactive websites. So this is a free web-based tool for creating interactive line graphs. And the interactive line graph allows you to do four things. You can examine different summary statistics. You can display lines for some or all individuals in each group. You can view a subset of groups, conditions, or time points. And you can view change force for any two conditions or time points. So the tool is described in more detail in the paper that was on the previous slide, and there's also a short video on the tool website illustrating how to use the tool. Thank you for attending this video, and I look forward to further discussion in class.